Anatasukas, a terrestrial Notasukian crocodilomorph from the Republic of Niger, was a fairly small animal, it was only about 70 centimeters, with an unusually broad duck-like snout, giving it a superficial resemblance to the fictional crocoduck. It also had a highly sensitive long nose, which probably allowed it to root around in vegetation for small prey, and sharp hook-shaped teeth to snag fish and frogs from shallow water. Unlike modern sprawling crocodilians, many ancient croc-line archosaurs were active upright walkers with a diverse range of forms, filling many different niches alongside their more famous dinosaurian cousins. Despite its appearance Anatosuchus is considered to have a diet of small, aquatic creatures. Caprosuchus was once thought to have been a primarily if not exclusively terrestrial predator. Evidence for this behavior includes the positioning of the orbits laterally and somewhat anteriorly, which suggests an overlap in vision. This is unlike many other Neosuchians, including extant crocodilians, in which the orbits are positioned dorsally as an adaptation to aquatic predation where the head can be held underwater while the eyes remain above the surface. Additional support for terrestrial predation can be found in the teeth and jaws. The fused nasal bones are thought to have provided reinforcement for the jaws against compression associated with a powerful bite. However, it is now thought to have been semi-aquatic. The name means boar crocodile in reference to its unusually large caniniform teeth which resemble those of a boar. The teeth of Simosuchus were shaped like maple leaves, which coupled with its short and deep snout suggests it was not a carnivore like most other crocodilomorphs. In fact, it was probably an herbivore, with its complex dentition resembling that of herbivorous iguanids. Like other Notosuchians, it was fully terrestrial, and the short tail would have had little use in swimming. The osteoderm shield was inflexible, restricting lateral movement in Simosuchus as a possible adaptation to an entirely terrestrial lifestyle. Robust legs are also consistent with terrestrial locomotion. A fossorial, or burrowing, lifestyle for Simosuchus has been suggested in its initial description based on the robust limbs and short snout, which appears shovel-like, and the underslung lower jaw that would prevent friction when the animal opens its jaws during burrowing. Pacasuchus, a Notosuchian crocodiliform from the mid-Cretaceous of Tanzania. This 50 cm long animal had an elongated body and relatively long limbs, and would have been an active terrestrial predator chasing after fast-moving small prey-like insects. The bony osteoderms on its body were much smaller and sparser than those found on most of its relatives, except for its tail, which was still heavily armored. It also had some of the most complex teeth of all known crocodilians, with surprisingly mammal-like canines and molars that gave it the ability to chew its food. Notosuchus was named in 1896 and was the first of what would become known as the Notosuchian crocodiles that would be described to science. It was small when compared to most other crocodiles, though itself still larger than most known Notosuchian genera. It was also one of the first crocodiles confirmed as being mostly if not entirely terrestrial. This means that Notosuchus spent most of their time roaming about on dry land, only approaching water to drink. It now seems that it would have lived like a modern-day wild pig, sniffing through the undergrowth and leaf litter, using smell to identify food that was otherwise hidden from other animals. Armadillosuchus is but one of many bizarre crocodiles from the Cretaceous period, but what makes this genus different are the armadillo-like plates in the form of flexible bands and rigid plates that run down the length of its body. It is widely believed to have been a terrestrial crocodile. Ideas from this come from analysis of the fossil site which back during the Cretaceous was thought to have had a very dry hot climate with seasonal rainfall as well as the legs which are better suited to walking than other more aquatic forms. Borussicus was almost certainly a terrestrial crocodile based upon simple observation of features of the skull. 
For comparison, a crocodile that hunts in the water will usually have its nostrils and eye sockets on the top of the snout so that it can see and breathe while swimming and hunting in the water. The teeth are usually conical to provide a greater amount of grip on a wet sand slippery body so that a crocodile can drag its victim into the water and drown it. The eyes and teeth of Borussicus however are clearly on the sides of the skull, meaning that it was not spending time looking up out of the water. All Sebicosuchians were carnivorous and terrestrial. The nares open at the very tip of the snout, suggesting that it lived on land rather than in water. The snout itself is laterally compressed, a feature shared with other terrestrial reptiles such as theropod dinosaurs. The laterally compressed snout of Sebicosuchians may have enabled them to withstand high forces during biting. The teeth are also laterally compressed, pointed, and serrated. Their shape would have allowed them to easily penetrate and slice flesh. The Baronasuchus lived during the early Cenozoic era, from the Mid-Eocene epoch until the Mid-Miocene. It was the largest terrestrial predator known to have lived during the so-called Age of Mammals. Based on other Sebicids, Baronasuchus would have had long legs situated directly under its body. These legs would have looked and functioned more like those of large mammalian predators than modern crocodiles. They would have been excellent for the terrestrial life of this huge reptile. They would not have been great for swimming. Depending on its metabolism, it may have needed to conserve energy when hunting. It could have easily done this by wading, hidden along wooded paths, and ambushing its prey in a quick attack. Of course, with its enormous size and long legs, it would not have had a hard time chasing other animals. With deep narrow snouts, powerful jaws and upright limbs, Sebicosuchids like Sebicus were clearly fast active predators, and must have been directly competing with similarly sized theropods during the Mesozoic. They were obviously doing well enough to survive alongside their distant dinosaur relatives for many millions of years, right up until the end Cretaceous extinction, but the surprising part is how the Sebicosuchians seem to survive the extinction just fine across most of their range, while the non-avian theropods obviously didn't. By the end of the Eocene the Sebicosuchians outside South America seem to have died off, coinciding with the rise of placental carnivorans, but the isolated South American forms continued their success for most of the rest of the Cenozoic. At the time of this video Zulmasuchus is known from relatively incomplete material, though the genus is thought to have been a terrestrial predator like its nearest relatives. Fossils of Zulmasuchus are aged as coming from the Danian period of the Paleocene, making it significantly older than both Sebicus and Langstonia. Langstonia was also an active terrestrial predator with long upright limbs, a deep skull with powerful jaw muscles, and serrated flesh-tearing teeth. The disappearance of the system of large rivers of the Amazon lake system and the gradual uplift of the Andes caused major ecological changes in South America in the mid-Miocene. The last Sebicids, Langstonia and Baronasuchus were likely apex predators in their environment, and as an effect they would be particularly susceptible to ecological changes that caused other lineages, particularly hoofed mammals to die out thus leading to extinction to the last Notosuchians crocodilomorphs of the world. While modern crocodilians are all semi-aquatic, their Mesozoic ancestors started off fully terrestrial, only really moving into their familiar water-based ecological niches around the mid-Jurassic when the dinosaurs were dominating on land. But on multiple occasions members of the Neosuchian croc lineage independently went back to fully terrestrial habits, and Tarsomordio is one of the most recently discovered examples. It had long slender limbs held in an upright posture, suggesting it was a swift and agile runner capable of chasing after fast-moving prey. Since it lived in a semi-arid environment that seems to have been a major nesting site for the herbivorous Convalosaurus, their hatchlings probably also made up a large part of its diet during the breeding season.
Laganosuchus was an approximately 6 meters long, squat fish eater with a 1 meter flat head. It would have stayed motionless for hours, waiting for prey to swim into its open jaws with spike-shaped teeth. These teeth running across the edges and would have fitted together tightly so that no fish trapped in the mouth could escape. Laying in the water with its jaws open for extended periods until a fish swam in. Once this happened, the jaws would snap together preventing escape. Laganosuchus acquired its name from its flat pancake-like jaws. Stomatosuchus also had an unusually long and flat head, with the upper jaw lined with hundreds of tiny conical teeth. Exactly what it ate with such a strange mouth is unknown, but the shape of its lower jaw suggests it may have had a large throat pouch, perhaps filter feeding somewhat like modern baleen whales. Only one fossil has ever been found, a single large skull which was kept in the Munich Museum. Unfortunately, in 1944 the museum was severely damaged in an Allied bombing raid, and Stomatosuchus was among the specimens destroyed, along with the original material of the much more famous Spinosaurus. Sarcosuchus was not just bigger than today's crocodiles it was also a lot older. Most crocodiles have an average lifespan in the wild of around 25 years, with some individuals reaching 30 or more. Study on the growth rings present on some of the osteoderms show that Sarcosuchus was around 40 years old and yet not fully grown when it died. Whereas today's crocodiles grow large and then stop when they reach adulthood, it's just kept getting bigger. It could be that the only limiting factor to how big it grew was when it could no longer sustain such a massive body with the available food supply. As such a massive predator Sarcosuchus would have had to have focused its attention on hunting animals that could provide enough sustenance to keep its body going, and the two main animal groups available to it were the dinosaurs and large lobe finned fish. The enlarged forearms are a unique adaptation amongst crocodiliforms, drawing parallels to sauropterygians, plesiosaurs and sea turtles. However, Brachiosuchus does not preserve paddle like forelimbs like the aforementioned groups. The limb proportions suggest that Brachiosuchus may have been a highly efficient and maneuverable underwater predator, possibly specialized in different prey than its relatives with more typical limb proportions. The forelimbs would have been of greater importance in locomotion, while the less specialized hind limbs may have been used as stabilizers. Acherontosuchus lived in a calm, shallow, inland freshwater habitat in the tropical rainforests of northeastern Colombia. Most dirosaurids, including the ancestors of Acherontosuchus, were well adapted to a coastal marine lifestyle. Like living crocodilians, these dirosaurids were able to control their pitch and buoyancy in the water by contracting muscles that run between the abdomen and the hip. Based on the shape of its ribs and limb bones, it probably had strong muscles along its back and in its legs that enabled movement on land. It probably lived in rivers that were present far from the ocean. Dirosaurus was similar in size to the largest living crocs, around 6 meters, but had thinner and less extensive bony osteoderm armor. During the Eocene the dirosaurids began to disappear, and by the late Eocene the last known species were found only in northern Africa. It's not entirely clear why these once successful Tethysuchians began to decline, but they may have been struggling to deal with the cooling climate trends at the time. If they managed to persist until the end of the Eocene, sudden temperature and sea level drops during the Eocene-Oligocene extinction probably finished them off entirely.